All right. Hey, everyone. I think we are live here in DIG. Yes, we are. All right. Hey, Brennan. How's it hey, going? Good. How are you? Good, good. So today, you and I are going to be talking a little bit about this uh, this topic that a lot of people don't like to talk about just because I think they're just afraid of the name DSO. Uh, and, and I think you and I have talked about this for a while now that um, you know, no one wants to do this, essentially, but at the end of the day, it's happening. It's the reality out there. Um, but before we jump into any of that stuff, um, there are a lot of people that know you, but there are a lot of people that don't know who you are. Um, some Somebody asked earlier today, um, well, who's this expert that you're going to be talking to? So so if, for people that don't know you, just tell me a little bit about yourself, um, what you do, how you're helping dentists, and what's your role in, in the DSO world? Yeah, absolutely. So I am uh, the owner of McLaren and Associates. We're a nationwide uh, sell-side advisory firm that specializes in helping dentists that are interested in pursuing a DSO affiliation or private equity partnership. Uh, we only represent sellers. Um, the history of the company is the, the largest dental practice brokerage firm in Texas. We've been around for 35 years. So uh, we do about 70 doctor to doctor transactions a year, specifically in Texas. And then we do DSO sell side representation uh, nationwide. Um, so I've got 22 years of experience in the dental industry, uh, about 10 years as a banker, and now 10 years as a broker and sell side advisor. Uh, so really just the, the MA world, dental specific for over 20 years. So I've seen kind of everything that can go right and wrong uh, in these transactions. Uh, a few years ago, you know, we saw private equity come into the dental industry hard. Um, we saw that a lot of doctors were selling to DSOs without representation. They were really uneducated about their EBITDA and valuations and what they were getting themselves into. So exactly. we decided to pivot and, and get involved and develop uh, a system and a product for representing dentists that are looking at this option. And, uh, you know, I know there's there's some negative connotation towards DSOs and there's a lot of people that are interested in it, uh, a lot of people that, you know, hate on it. Uh, I'm here just to educate. I'm not necessarily an advocate for selling to a DSO, uh, but like you said, the reality is people are going to do it with or without us. It's happening more and more every day. The, the industry is consolidating at a rapid pace, and I just want to make sure doctors fully understand what their practice is worth, and if they're going to go this route, that they get everything they deserve in a transaction. Absolutely. Yeah. And before we jump into all of that, um, I think we we have to touch on the topic of of interest rates. Um, obviously, you know, the Fed raised the the interest rates again by 75 basis points. Um, and it, it seems like, you know, all the all the raises that they've done in the past haven't done much uh, to really tame the inflation. But the markets are struggling. Real estate markets are starting to show some cracks. Um, obviously, P.E., private equity is highly dependent on, on these rates because the money that they borrow, borrow from the banks, the, the money that they promise their investors has some correlation with what's going on in the markets out there. Um, it's all about the risk reward. And you know, if I can make more money in the stock market than, than PE, then I'm going to put my money in, in the stock market. If I can make more money in PE, I'm going to put my money in, in PE. Um, right now there's you know, everyone's like, hey, why don't you just put your money in, in the treasury because you can get 4% for doing nothing. Right. But nonetheless, there's so much movement that's happening out there. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of fear in the markets now. And there are people that are, that, they'll tell you that, okay, maybe things are going to stabilize here a little bit. There are people that'll say, you have seen nothing and there's a lot more coming. Um, in your world, have you noticed that if, are, are transactions slowing down or are dentists kind of wanting to maybe pull back a little bit? Is PE wanting to kind of pull back a little bit? Um, what's what's going on? What kind of things are you hearing? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, if anybody tells you they know what the future is going to look like, they're lying. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the past, it, it, it was relatively predictable as far as you know, the Fed making decisions to raise interest rates, they pull that lever and inflation is going to come down. But there's been so much monetary intervention over the past 10 years 
you know, I feel like the Fed's just playing whack-a-mole and they don't really know exactly what's going to happen. They pull the, the interest rate lever and it hasn't really had an impact on inflation. Hopefully it will. And hopefully we'll see inflation slow down and the rates will start to cool off and come back down. But uh, we're definitely at an inflection point. It's hard to say what's going to happen over the next 12 to 24 months. And obviously we've got this, uh, you know, potential recession uh, looming. How that's impacted the, the DSO marketplace, how it's going to impact private equity remains to be seen. I can tell you that valuations are still at an all-time high. Uh, they really ramped up coming out of COVID when dentistry proved that it can pretty much survive, you know, whatever the world throws at it. Um, mm -hmm. So dentistry rebounded so quickly, it pushed a lot of private equity money into uh, dentistry and the, and the healthcare sector in general. A lot of private equity was leaving tech and coming into healthcare. Uh, a lot of companies that were on pause in buying practices during COVID finally got the green light from their banks and their investors, and the demand for opportunity skyrocketed, and in turn, valuation skyrocketed. So mm -hmm. we're still operating in an environment where valuations are, I think, artificially inflated, which is great for sellers. But interest rates uh, in a recession is going to have some type of impact that's going to play out here over the next, I would say, six to 12 months. Uh, we are, are less worried about interest rates in the respect that there's still no better place to make money than in private equity. They're generating such robust returns on their investments, you know, in the range of, you know, 30 to 90% IRR. I mean, there's nowhere else in the marketplace that you can make that type of return. And right. rising interest rates is going to eat into those returns, but they're still so robust for the time being that, we're going to see, I think, more and more money flow into private equity and more and more investment in the dental industry. So we're less worried about rates. We're a little bit more worried about banks tightening up uh, mm -hmm. on availability of capital. So it's not necessarily the rates that will impact things. It's the availability of capital. And there's a lot of DSOs that have been growing really, really quickly. They've proven that they're good at aggregating. But if there is a downturn in the marketplace, and banks tighten up and start to pay attention to covenants and uh, leverage, they're going to pay closer attention to, great, you can aggregate, but can you operate, right? Mm -hmm. are, are you maintaining good margins? Are you meeting your bank covenants? Uh, and if you're not, if you were just in the aggregate and flip game and you're not in the sustainable, you know, operating a business long-term game, then you could see banks tighten up with those DSOs. We have seen the really, really smart DSOs start to, to tighten up and be a little bit more choosy about the opportunities that they bid on. When they bid, they've been very, very aggressive. Um, so they may be chasing less opportunities, putting less bids in the marketplace, but the bids they are making are at, at peak valuation metrics. So it'll be, it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. But I think the market could soften and this window where we've seen sky high valuations could, you know, I don't think it's going to slam shut, right? But it could start to close a little bit. Right. And I equate that to uh, to real estate a lot. You know, for the last, I don't know, five, seven years, I mean, you could pick up any property and, and essentially make money on it because you're like, hey, I buy this, I get a loan from the bank, put it up for rent valuations are so high it, it works all that kind of stuff but now is is where you truly have that that test for those investors that can stomach higher interest rates if their expenses go up do they have enough margin to to basically you know keep up with with those expenses um and i look at that uh, you know a dso that's being selective and who they're acquiring but offering an aggressive deal is probably a good thing because they're actually trying to go after the the dentist that probably has better cash flows than the the ones that they're skipping on um and they want to make sure that there's enough buffer so that they can pay a high valuation but also make money for their investors because the whole flip game is kind of coming to an end in real estate that was so popular you buy something and i mean this was happening you buy something and you could literally list it without making any change to, to the property a month later, two months later, six months later for 15, 20% higher for doing nothing. And that, that flip game has, has basically come to an end. And I feel like 
when I think about DSOs, you know, some of that was kind of happening in the, in the DSO world also where they would buy all these practices, recap and say, oh, now we're worth this much. And then they'll say, oh, we'll, we'll redo, we'll do another recap and now we're worth this much. So it, it's kind of scary, but at the same time, I think it's, it makes sense for those DSOs that are taking their time, but also basically trying to grab highest quality practices out there. Yeah, the, the DSOs that are buying quality assets and using deal structure to create sustainability, right? A joint venture model where the dentist retains equity and is vested or, you know, extending the post-closing commitment from where it used to be two to three years, you know, now four to five years is, is kind of the norm. So they're, they're making sure that they do their diligence, they're going after quality assets, and they're, they're implementing, you know, inventive deal structures to, to make sure that th there's not a lot of turnover. Uh, I think, uh, you know, those that were playing to the greater fool theory, right? Like there's always going to be somebody that's going to pay more than what I paid for that asset. If they haven't structured their, their business in a sustainable way, if they don't have infrastructure and they don't know how to operate, should there be a downturn and they not be able to continue to grow or recap? Those are the DSOs that are really, really going to struggle. And that's where I think you're going to see some consolidation among the DSOs, the weaker DSOs that weren't built to operate, that can't grow, that can't recap, that are having a lot of trouble are going to end up selling to those DSOs that are, are stronger and have the operational fortitude to survive uh, a downturn. And a big part of our job in representing sellers is to vet these DSOs and figure out, you know, who's well capitalized, who has a sustainable model, who's got the operational fortitude to really bring value to, to the seller, uh, especially if they're looking to sell to alleviate the management burden. So a big part of what we do is constantly vetting DSOs and figuring out you know, who, who we should put our clients in front of. Yeah, and, and I think when we talk about the deal structure, um, and, and I think this might be one of, one of the things that, that you're gonna talk about anyways, but it's not just about the price, but it's really about how that dentist is going to spend the next, I don't know, three to five years in that practice um, and how to basically cash out uh, in the most profitable way, way for the dentist. Um, I, I feel like, and, and Stephen, um, he comment, commented this earlier today. He just said, you know, I feel like we sell practices for, for too cheap. Uh, the multiple that the dentists get um, you know, whether they're selling in, in private practice or to a DSO, it ends up being quite a bit lower than what you get for another business out there. I mean, do you see that that that's changing a little bit or? You yeah, know, I remember like multiples have definitely ratcheted up in the dental world, but you're right in the sense that a dental practice, because there's so much key man risk, right? they're going to sell for a much lower multiple than uh, a renewal based business like an insurance company or a manufacturing business where you know the revenue is not being is not solely contingent upon your two hands right so right. A, a business that you know there's a lot of key man risk and the owner the entrepreneur is responsible for a lot of the production is always going to trade for a, a lower multiple than you know another type of business where the owner is more of like an absentee owner uh, and the key man risk is diversified among, you know, a, a wide array of employees. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, multiples are still attractive, but economics typically can't be the sole driver of a decision to sell to a DSO unless you're on the tail end of your career or you've got some type of life change, you know, you're going to relocate at some point in the future, um, or you're looking for, you know, infrastructural operational support. So mm -hmm. if it's solely economic and you're like, hey, I, I don't have a, a life change on the horizon. I'm fine with owning the business and the stress of management. Uh, if it's solely economic, it starts to be a much harder conversation, especially as you stretch the time frame, five years, 10 years, 15 years, mm -hmm. unless you're cool with just, you know, taking the chips off the table and de-risking and then reinventing yourself after you fulfill your post-closing commitment. Right. And I think that's 
probably the, the number one thing that comes up um, when I speak to some uh, dentists that, that have been practicing for 20 years, they turn 50, they're like the, the biggest stressor of their, of their life becomes managing the employees, managing that practice. And that's probably the number one reason they're wanting to, to get out of a private practice from the management standpoint, but still be able to practice for the next five to six years, five, seven years, um, maximize their income and still have some uh, some equity left in the in the practice. And the other flip side of that is if you're cashing out early enough, now you have that extra cash to invest in the markets uh, or you're maybe investing in that in that DSO, who knows? Um, so how how does that work? Um, have you have you seen that like the what's like the most typical age group that that comes and, and says, okay, I this is the time for me to sell? Yeah, I mean it's changed remarkably, right? I mean, obviously when we were doing just doctor to doctor transactions previous to about five years ago. I mean, our average client was 65, 67 years old, looking mm -hmm. to sell to retire, you know, in, in the immediate future. Um, as the, the DSO option has come into play, and as you alluded to, the management burden has grown so significantly, you know, a lot of people have become victims of their own success. You know, maybe you were 32 years old when you started or bought your first practice, maybe you were married, but you, you probably didn't have a family, right? And now you're 10 years into it. You're 42 years old. You've built a multi-million dollar business. You've got a lot of employees, a lot of headaches, and you've got young kids and, you know, you've sacrificed a, a lot of your time with them. And, and now you see that, man, they're only going to be in the house for another, you know, six, eight years. You want to maximize that time before they go out on their own. And you're like, hey, this isn't worth it. Right. I got to reprioritize my, my my life. And that's where we've seen a lot of dentists say, hey, you know, my business isn't everything. Right. I'm going to reprioritize my life. I'm going to spend more time on my health or my family. I'm going to get help from an operational you know, perspective and I'm going to de-risk. Right. I built this really valuable asset. At least it's super valuable today. Let me go ahead and take some chips off the table to favor valuation. Let me go ahead and affiliate with a larger entity that maybe if there is a downturn is more prepared to, to uh, survive um, and leverage the economies of scale that DSOs at scale can leverage um, and, and go that route. So we're seeing younger and younger doctors look at the DSO option. I've sold practices this year for doctors in their late 30s. Um, but I would say our average age client is in their mid to late 40s that's pursuing the DSO option. They've got quite a bit of runway left, but they wanna de-risk, they want some operational support, and they want the ability to pivot at some point in the future, whether that means uh, a relocation uh, or just you know getting out of ownership completely. And if you're a big producer, you can earn a really, really nice income just working chair side. Right, makes sense. All right, so let's, let's jump into uh, some of those mistakes. Um, you mentioned there are, there are five key mistakes that, that dentists make. Um, so yeah, tell me one by one. Um, and, and I just want to hear that. Yeah, I, I absolutely appreciate that. So I, first and foremost, responding to an unsolicited offer, right? So DSOs have built marketing machines designed to get in front of you without somebody like me at the table, right? So they're constantly sending direct mail. They've got business development teams, guys that are going out, pounding the pavement, knocking on doors, trying to get your attention and trying to start a conversation about buying your practice. Hey, just send me your financials. Let me make an offer. And then a lot of doctors, before they know it, they've got what seems to be, you know, a relatively attractive offer from somebody that they, they like, or maybe their buddy sold to them or whatever. And they sell their practice without really any due diligence. Um, so they didn't create a competitive offer. Uh, competitive marketplace for their practice. They didn't create multiple bids. Um, if you've met one DSO, you've met one DSO, right? Our job is to educate people regarding the EBITDA and the value of their practice. And then if it makes sense, go create a highly competitive environment, bring multiple DSOs and deal structures to the table and ultimately find the DSO that's the right fit for the goals that the doctor wanted to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And then leverage that, that competition to get the highest valuation and the best deal structure we possibly can. So if you're responding to an unsolicited offer, if you're talking to a DSO without somebody like us at the table, 
you're going to leave optionality and money on the table hands down every single time. And we've seen it time and time again where we have a client call. They've already been in discussions with a couple of DSOs. Maybe they already have a couple of offers on the table. And we say, hey, time out. Let's take a step back. Let's do an input analysis. Let's talk offline about your goals. And then let's take this to market in a competitive bid process. We'll put it back in front of those couple of buyers you've already been talking to. And wouldn't you know it, when we walk in the room and we throw the package on the table to those same buyers, all of a sudden their offers go up by you know, 10, 20, 30%. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems pretty disingenuous, but the reality is, I mean, their goal at the end of the day is to buy the asset as cheaply as they can and, you know, buy low, sell high, right? Um, I think everybody in DIG understands that. So our, our goal is to just keep them honest. And if you, uh, you've got to run a formal process, control the narrative in order to get max value for the practice. On average, um, do you think that dentists end up selling their practice for what, maybe... 10% under their potential max offer, 20, 30? I mean, are, are we talking about big, big numbers sometimes? On average, I'd say 20%. I mean, we, we just sold a practice that had a couple of offers on the table in the Northeast before we got involved. And we actually ended up, after nine offers, selling to one of the buyers that had already made an offer at a 1.5 million higher than their initial offer. So... I mean, that's that's real money. That's substantial. So obviously we're going to get paid a commission, but our goal at the end of the day is to double, triple, quadruple our commission so that we're driving value to the client, not only in the form of economics, but also in optionality, right? I mean, mm -hmm. how do you know that that one or two DSOs you're talking to when there's 250 DSOs operating across the country is, is the one that's the best fit, Right. You've got to date around to figure out who you want to marry. So when you're, let's say you're, you're are you trading a better purchase price or, or selling price, I, I guess I should say, in exchange for other terms that are not as favorable? Like, do you feel like that that ever plays a role? Because there's so much that goes on. I think the number one thing that, that comes up for most of us is if we sell, how many years am I going to be committed to this DSO? Or what if something happens to me? What if something happens where I've got to move. There's so many different factors, right? right? And there's some of those holdbacks where the DSO says, well, we'll pay you 50% now, but we'll pay you the other 50% over five years, 10% per year kind of thing. Um, are there situations where you might say, well, look, I'm going to try to get you 80% of the value upfront. Um, and then the other 20% could be could be over five years. Like, can those things be negotiated for? They can be negotiated. I mean, each DSO has kind of a formal framework, a deal structure that they, that they, a playbook that they like to work from. So it's important one that you compare different deal structures, you know, not just the fit of the DSO and the culture and the operational fortitude and the management capability, but also the different deal structures across those DSOs. And to some degree that they are pliable, to some degree they are rigid, right? If they're a joint venture company, they're going to stick to doing a joint venture. They're not going to do a, a holding company uh, structure. But yeah, you can see movement across those terms. And depending on why you're selling and what's most important to you, you might choose to take a slightly lower valuation from a DSO that has a better deal structure or is a better fit. Our goal at the end of the day, if, if the process plays out, how, how it's designed to, we figure out what DSO out of the, the five to 10 to 15 that we've talked to, which one is the best fit, right? From a cultural perspective, from an infrastructural perspective, from a deal structure perspective, who do you like the most? And then let's leverage the competition to get the highest valuation from that particular DSO. And we're successful in doing that the vast majority of the time. Occasionally, you know, that DSO maybe won't be the highest offer, but, you know, at least we leverage them as much as we could to make the economics as favorable as possible. And because of the other factors, fit, feel, and structure, we were willing to accept a slightly lower offer from that DSO because they were the right one for us. 
Would you would you mind going into um, what a deal structure is? Would you kind of talk about what's favorable, what's not favorable kind of thing? I know this this can vary from you know one selling dentist to another, um, but what ends up kind of working out th the best, I guess, in, in majority of the cases? It really depends on what you're looking for, right? I mean, all these conversations always, they're very situational and they always start with why, right? Why are you selling and what are your goals? And that will kind of determine which DSOs make the most sense and which deal structures make the most sense. Uh, in our last podcast together, we, we went through the different deal structures um, and, and I'd be happy to you know share that with anybody that wants to inquire, but really it comes down to, you know, are you selling hundred percent of the practice? And, and if so, you know, are you taking all the cash uh, off the table up front and locking in your, your valuation from day one? Are you selling all the practice and then investing in the holding company stock of the DSO? And if so, how much are you investing and what is the, the potential return on that investment? And at what point are you entering the life cycle of their recap? You know, because if you enter early, your return should be higher because you're going to have a longer hold time to, to hitting a recap versus entering late in the cycle and having a shorter hold time, your return is going to be muted. And then you've got the, the joint venture structure where you're going to sell a piece of your practice to the DSO and then retain equity within your own four walls. And you have the opportunity to liquidate that equity and partner in full in the future at the parent company multiple. There's a lid for every pot, right? It really depends on why you're selling and what you're looking to accomplish economically regarding which deal structure makes the most sense for you. I will say that if you're closer, you know, you're using this as an exit strategy and you really want to limit your post-closing commitment, it's going to impact your valuation and certain deal structures might not be a fit. You know, joint venture deal structure is typically kind of a longer term commitment a more open-ended commitment than, you know, the Heartland model, hey, I'm going to sell 100%, I'm going to work back for two or three years on an earn out and get my, the rest of my money, you know, over the course of fulfilling my post-closing employment agreement. So, you know, to each their own and, and through our, our valuation process and as we get to know the client, we kind of zero in on exactly what they're looking to accomplish and then that may lead us to only consider a subset of DSOs that offer a particular deal structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. So, you know, like the, one of the biggest counter arguments uh, that ends up being is, is if you were going to, let's say you had five years left, you were going to work for five more years, you, you sell now and you, you basically work for, for the DSO for additional five years, you're getting paid, I don't even know, 50% up front, the other 50% over five years. Or somebody says, well, why don't you just work in your own practice, um, maximize your profits for, for those additional five years so you're not sharing those profits with anyone else. And then at the end of the day, just sell it to, to a private buyer. Do you see situations where, I mean, I can I understand there's obviously situations that it's going to benefit you being in practice for longer but what are the pros where somebody says, well, no, I, I think I do need to consider a DSO in, in, my, in my case? Yeah, so you make a great point. And that is, I mean, the longer you stretch that post-closing commitment, it starts to erode the, uh, the, the value in selling to a DSO from a pure economic standpoint, right? Um, now, if you hit a recap or a couple of recaps, that's easily going to catch you up or exceed the hold scenario. I mean, we often run, we actually have a model we run for clients that show, hey, here's a, a no sell scenario. Here's a sell scenario under a joint venture structure. Here's a sell scenario under a holding company structure. And then we make certain assumptions to see how that plays out economically over time. But no mm -hmm. doubt, the further you stretch the time frame, the, the more likely it is that a DSO transaction is going to look less attractive unless you layer on multiple recaps. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty there, right? right. Um, so why would you look to sell to a DSO and, and stay on for five years? Give up that, that benefit uh, of the EBITDA uh, for an upfront purchase price. I mean, it's a few reasons, right? One, de-risking, taking the chips off the table. There's no guarantee that your practice is gonna continue to perform at a high level. 
that you're going to be healthy, that you're not going to have some type of life change, right? So de-risking de by taking some chips off the table for a lot of people is, is a smart thing to do, especially if you can take enough chips off the table that essentially your retirement is fully funded and protected. You know, time value of money, taking a lump sum up front, investing that and using compounding returns to generate, uh, you know, wealth generation. Um, and then, you know, management, operational help, you know, a lot of doctors are struggling with that. Um, a lot of DSOs are currently struggling with that. I mean, there's a staffing crisis right now. I mean, the biggest existential threat to dentistry at the moment is talent from staff and doctor perspective. Um, so the, the, um, that's probably the biggest issue that's facing a lot of practice owners. And the HR component is the biggest thing that's forcing a lot of people, keeping people up at night and forcing them to look at you know, the DSO option from a managerial perspective. Um, and then wealth creation opportunities, the, the opportunity to invest alongside private equity and hopefully generate some robust returns through recaps, as well as to tap into other potential private equity investments that your DSO uh, private equity back partner has available. Because a lot of these private equity firms that are backing these DSOs, when you come on as a partner, they open up other investment opportunities outside of the dental industry to you. So there's other wealth creation opportunities that can happen through rubbing shoulders and getting into bed with private equity. And I'm glad you mentioned staffing. So let's say if one of the primary reasons a, a, a dentist wants to, wants to sell because of, of staffing issues, and I think that's been extremely stressful for a lot of people, um, that, that you just feel like you're, you're at that breaking point, you don't want to deal with it anymore, you just want to be done with it. Is there enough support from a DSO that actually alleviates that issue? Or are you just kind of saying, look, hey, I'm, I sold 50% of my practice, but I'm still dealing with those same staffing issues because I'm, you know, still part owner of this practice and they just want me to kind of do all this HR hiring and firing and all that kind of stuff. Is there enough support from these DSOs that that actually takes you from that that responsibility of managing that staff? Yeah, look, I mean, staffing right now is a struggle for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a 500 location DSO or a single location practice owner. Across the board, it's a struggle. I mean, they have dedicated recruiters and HR people, and they have the resources to be able to pay typically better benefits and hire, you know, comp. So that, that helps from a recruitability standpoint. But let's not act like if you sell to a DSO, that, that that pain point just completely evaporates overnight. Right. Um, you'll have more support and, and you will have, you know, de-risk and take some chips off the table. So maybe you don't feel quite as much pressure mm -hmm. um, to, to that degree. And you're not out there on an island. You've got a, a vested party with deep pockets and resources to help you. But look, it, it's, it's a struggle regardless uh, if, you're, if you're a big dog, you know, or, or a single location practice owner. Um, and, and that kind of go, that goes into my next you know mistake that practice owners make. So that's a great segue. And that's selling to the wrong DSO. You know whether again it all starts with why, right? Why are you looking to sell? And if you're looking to sell for managerial and operational support, you better sell to a DSO that's got the ability to support your practice, right. because a lot of DSOs, you know, are are centralization and operational light, right? They don't want to burden their P&L and their balance sheet with infrastructure because that impacts arbitrage. It impacts the return at, at recap. So there are some DSOs out there that are, you know, a lot of these, you know, what, what people refer to as like IDSOs, that they're hands off. They don't help manage your practice. I mean, if you're selling your business because you want help from an operational standpoint, you better get it or else it made no sense to liquidate a portion of the practice. So uh, if it's purely economic, then, you know, it, that, that's a little bit of an easier conversation because all you're really evaluating is the economics of the transaction. You know, you're not evaluating infrastructure. So I'll say it again. If you met one DSO, you met one DSO. If you want a DSO to just, you know, buy a piece of your business and be in the background and be hands off from a managerial perspective. Probably don't want to sell to 
you know, one of the top five DSOs in the country that have massive infrastructure and a heavy hand from a managerial perspective. Uh, if you want robust infrastructure and support and you want them to immediately come in, plug somebody into your office and help you manage, probably better to go with one of the big guys. So making sure that your aspirations and your goals align with what the DSO is bringing to the table is critically important because the last thing you want to do is sell a piece of your business and then be miserable post-closing or not get what you were looking for. Right. That makes sense. Um, and, it, and it's tough because, you know, as uh, what your problems are today may not be the same thing a year from now, um, or they probably were different two years ago. Um, I think for most people right now, the the staffing is is the biggest issue when you talk to them about why they want to sell their practice or they're just tired of dealing with uh, temporary staffing and that kind of stuff. I mean, I think that, that temporary staffing has just become such a big business. You get sometimes uh, assistants asking 30, 35, 40 bucks an hour, hygienists asking 60, 70 bucks an hour because someone's going to say yes and, and, and say, well, you can, you can come sub here. I, I need you for today. And, and there's, there's really no, no other option. And some of that just, is just killing cash flow right now in, in a lot of practices. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things when I talked about earlier about banks tightening up and, and covenants and how that could impact DSOs. I mean, DSOs are filling the pinch, you know, from a, a increase in overhead perspective. Yeah. Can they leverage economies of scale to help negotiate, you know, better payer rates and better supply and, and lab uh, expenses? Sure. But they're dealing with the same, you know, uh, crisis that that you guys are, that solo practice owners are from a staffing uh, perspective and from a cost perspective. Um, so that's squeezing margins. And if you have a downturn ec economically and that squeezes the top line, you start to squeeze EBITDA and, you know, the, the banks are paying attention to that. So that right. could cause, you know, financing for a lot of these DSOs to to tighten up. Makes sense. What what else do you see as as one of the mistakes that's uh, that's happening out there? Yeah, I, th I think one of the key mistakes that people make is just not asking the right questions, right? Uh, one, being thoughtful about selling to a DSO in the first place. Does it make sense? Uh, I, I'm blessed to be really busy. So we we give purely objective advice to people that are considering this option. Does it make sense to, to go the DSO route? Um, and we convince as many people not to sell to a DSO as we convince that it is the best option. So I think being pragmatic, being thoughtful about finding your why and determining if this is the right option in the first place is critically important. And then if you're going to go that direction, if you're going to go down the DSO path, there, the, com the, the conversation should be detailed and complicated, right? There are a ton of questions that you should be asking about infrastructure, support. What are you going to change? What are you not going to change? Um, deal structures and economics and uh, who's your private equity sponsor? Have, have you recapped before? Have they been successful with other dental platforms? What's the pedigree of the people that you're getting in bed with from a private equity perspective uh, it, you know, and from an operational perspective? What, who are the C-level executives within the DSO? What's their pedigree? What's their background? Um, all these things are critically important. And then when you get into the finer points of the deal structures, right? Is it a holding company uh, deal structure? If so, at what point am I entering the life cycle of the recap? What am I paying for the stock? What is my projected return? Versus if it's a joint venture structure, um, are you going to burden the uh, the EBIT of my practice with a management fee at recap? And how that how does that impact economic returns? Um, and if you're comparing a holding company structure to a DSO uh, uh, joint venture structure, which structure is the best for you, right? And if you're a joint venture structure and they're a year away from recap versus a holding company structure and they're a year away from recap, economically speaking, the joint venture structure is probably going to outperform the holding company structure hands down every time because you're going to get the full lift of the parent company multiple, regardless of when you enter the recap cycle, as opposed to entering the recap cycle late in a holding company structure where your return is going to be muted. 
So these nuances move the needle substantially. Um, so just not asking the right questions, not, look, you don't know what you don't know. If you've never done, I, I've done this hundreds of times now. Most of you have never done it before. So we provide a detailed list of questions and discussion topics that we want our clients to ask each DSO during the vetting process. So just as much as DSOs are doing diligence on our clients' practices, we want them doing diligence on each DSO to make sure they ask all the right questions, they find the right fit, and they make a fully informed decision. And look, if, if you get there at the end of the day and you've talked to 10 DSOs and you've looked at the offers and you don't find somebody you like or you don't find a fit or the economics aren't right, you don't do it. I mean, it's, it's that simple. So I kind of want to backtrack on the, on the, the PE portion of that. A typical PE, um, you know, what kind of DSOs, I guess, are they dealing with um, in terms of the PE is getting funding from investors, probably like us, like, you know, that, that want to invest in, in PE and that kind of stuff. There's obviously, I think, what Canadian teachers retirement account invests a bunch of money in PE and Heartland Dental Stock. Um, how does that process work, you know, from the money flow from a PE to a DSO to the dentist? And then the other question I have is, is do you think that if the economy does start to take that, that downturn, are those, those, their goals change? When their goals change, your outcome changes. Can that happen where there are no recap events? Can they say, well, we don't have any recaps. You know, we, we, planned on we intended to do recaps every three years for example or whatever that might be but now it's going to be you know seven years or ten years like can can that happen i mean there's no there's no guarantees in that regard right most of them are on a four to five year recap cycle i mean there's dsos out there that are seven years into what was supposed to be a four to five year cycle there's dsos that have recapped in two three years you know because they, they built a really attractive model and they're growing rapidly so there's no guarantees as far as when you're going to get your investment back. In some instances, we're able to negotiate a put option where you have the opportunity to sell your equity after a, a certain period of time at a predetermined EBITDA multiple, uh, likely congruent with the initial transaction multiple. So it's going to be muted compared to what you would get in a recap, but at least you have the opportunity to exit that equity. There's very few DSOs out there that allow for that, but we have been successful in some instances negotiating that. But no doubt, I mean, there's some risk involved, right? From a monetary and a timing perspective. Um, you know, how do you vet a, a PE sponsor? I would say, you know, ha, do they have other dental platforms that they've recapped? You know, how many times has this particular DSO recapped? Um, many of them have never recapped. Some of them have recapped two or three times. Uh, there's going to be, it's risk reward though, right? So if they're a smaller DSO, 20, 30, 40 locations, and they haven't had a recapitalization event, they're still working on their first one, you would expect that your return should be higher than if, you know, you're investing stock in Heartland Dental. As the DSO gets bigger, typically the risk is lower and the returns are muted. So it's all relative risk reward. Um, but that needs to play out in the economics. Could you, could you also tell us two things. What is a, what is a put option? And also what is a recap? Um, Cause I know some of us yeah. know, some of us don't know what a recap event is. Uh, and then this put option that you talked about, that's, that sounds pretty smart, but you said, okay, so it's kind of like, I guess I look at it, maybe an insurance policy where you say, okay, well, you'll still get probably what you put in, but if the market does really well, you get a lot more back. Right. So let's say a DSO was buying your practice for seven times EBITDA, right? And they're going to buy, I mean, whether it's a joint venture structure and you're retaining equity at the practice level, or you're taking a, a portion of your proceeds and rolling it into holding company stock. A put option means that after a certain period of time, typically congruent to your post-closing employment commitment. So let's say it's five years, you agree to stay on post-closing. After five years, you would have the right to sell your, your remaining equity, whether it's JV equity or, or holding company equity, at a predetermined EBITDA multiple congruent with typically the multiple they would have paid on the front end. So any remaining equity that you have 
you would be allowed to sell it for 7x after five years. Mm -hmm. So that at least you have the option that, to liquidate all of your equity and exit that investment upon fulfillment of your employment agreement, rather than you know holding your breath and waiting around for a recap to happen. Um, again, I don't want to promise that, right? Because it's there aren't many DSOs that will agree to it. But in a highly competitive situation with certain DSOs, they will agree to a put option. It's not the norm, but we have been able to get DSOs to agree to it in some cases. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to set that precedent. Um, a recapitalization event essentially means that the current investor that holds the investment that owns the DSO is selling the DSO to the next investor, right? So what happens is a DSO will uh, form with typically a platform investment, right? In the range of two to $3 million in EBITDA. That's their first acquisition. That's when the DSO is formed. And then they'll grow from there. And they may grow to, let's say, 100 locations before their first recap. They may pay 10, 12 times EBITDA for the initial platform investment, but then they're going to cost average that investment down over the course of the recap cycle by paying five to seven X for all the additional practices they layer on. So let's say at the end of the day, they're cost averaged at a seven X multiple and they mm -hmm. trade for 13 times EBITDA, or let's just say round numbers, 14 times EBITDA in their first uh, recapitalization event. Well, you would say, well, you know, they generated a two X return, right? They were cost average at seven X and they sold for 14 times EBITDA. The reality though is by using leverage, they're able to generate exponential returns because they may have invested, uh, let's say they have 50 million in EBITDA at cost average at 7X. They may have invested $350 million in the investment, but only 10% of that was actual equity, right? 35 million in cash, the rest of it was debt. Right. By using that leverage, they're able to generate rather than you think it's a 2x return, it's probably more like a 7 to 9x return on that 35 million that they initially invested through leveraging cheap bank money. So right. you can see that if interest rates spike when something is that leveraged, or if banks tighten up and they're not able to continue to grow at the clip they need to grow to create that arbitrage, it could really eat into the returns. So working with a private equity firm that's well capitalized is also critically important so that if for some reason their banks tighten up, they've got more equity to deploy above and beyond the initial fund that they raised. Does that make sense? Right. It does. Okay. And the, these are complicated matters to discuss, you know, in a Facebook Live. I've got some articles and some financial exercises that can show how these returns are generated, how they play out with real numbers. I gotcha. Okay. What's the... Um, so when this recap happens, there's what another DSO that that ends up buying the the existing one, or where does it all go? So good, good question. So typically, in a uh, in a well done recap, the private equity sponsor is selling to another private equity sponsor or a larger investor. Right. So the DSO remains intact. Its identity remains intact. Its management team remains intact. All the agreements that were signed with the doctors, whether it be leases or employment agreements or what have you, those all remain intact. The doctors have the ability to liquidate all or some, depending on the situation of their holding company stock or JV equity at, at a handsome return and typically have the option, possibly the obligation to roll equity into the next recap cycle. But I would expect the management team and the DSO to remain intact. You have seen scenarios where a struggling DSO will hit what they'll call a recapitalization event and sell to a larger DSO. I mean, in that scenario, that's typically a, a failed recap event in the sense that you're going to see modest returns, if any, uh, when you are consolidated by a, a larger DSO. Um, so, Tim, go ahead. So I was going to ask, and actually this is a question that Lance was asking earlier. Um, if you are a, let's say you sell to a small DSO and you get acquired by a bigger one, their rules are different. They, they do things differently. Are you then 
as a dentist that's still holding their you know end of their deal on the three to five year commitment do you then have to basically abide by the new dso's rules um or do you have an option where you're like hey i i didn't agree to this i'm gonna you've got to cash me out like what how, are those things like in a contract like that 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 wouldn't happen to you or so you don't get screwed over like how does that process work no i mean if, or, if, or, here's my question so let's say your small dso says like hey your monthly uh, production needs to maintain at a hundred thousand a month or you're going to start losing i'm just like throwing out numbers like five percent valuation every year that you don't meet those numbers or something the larger DSO says, well, no, 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 our numbers, you got to meet production levels at, at 120,000 a month. How does that all, is that part of a contract or how does it that work? Yeah. So structurally, you know, the legal agreements that you negotiate with the initial DSO that you partner with are going to hold up over time, regardless if a recap occurs, regardless if it sells to another DSO, the, the buyer of that asset has to honor whatever legal agreements are in place. However, the culture could change, right? Mm -hmm. If a smaller DSO gets gobbled up by a larger DSO, you know, the culture and the infrastructure and the management team of the smaller DSO could disappear, right? And, and now you're partnered with an entity that's unknown to you and, and maybe that you wouldn't have chosen to partner with from the beginning. We haven't seen up to this point a lot of consolidation among DSOs. I think we will at some point in the future. We'll see the larger guys you know, merging with or buying some of the smaller guys, I think you need to be aware that if you sell to a smaller DSO, there is a chance that they could be acquired by another DSO. Um, and, and that could potentially change what your life looks like post-close, not from a contractual perspective, but more of, from a culture and operational perspective. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I'm just kind of reading through some of these comments here. Um, what, el what other mistakes are, are dentists making or potential mistakes, I should say? Yeah. I mean, a, a big one is not having proper representation, right? We, we already mm -hmm. talked about that DSOs behave differently when you bring like somebody like us to the table, right? We keep them honest. They know they're going to be in a competitive situation. They know they're going to have to put their best foot forward from a structural and economic perspective. So making sure you're working with an advisor one that takes an objective approach and just isn't trying to convince you to sell your practice so they can make a commission, that, that's really taking a thoughtful approach and a long-term approach. Hey, we look at your numbers and I actually had two conversations like this today. We went through the valuation process. The numbers were a mess. These practices need to make some changes. They need to clean up their financials. Hey, let's wait a year, clean stuff up. Let's go to market in an opportune environment uh, regardless of, you know, some of the market conditions that are at our control that we can't change, but let's take the time to get buttoned up and max value when we go to market rather than rush into market when your financials are a mess and leaving a bunch of money on the table. Um, right. so making sure that you got a good advisor that's experienced, that's an advocate for you, that's going to do the right thing. That's objective in their approach. And then if it makes sense to sell to a DSO that can execute at a high level, and it's going to keep the DSOs honest, create a multiple bid situation and, and max out value, structure, uh, and fit. Are there DSOs that, that they'll pay you 100% of the, of the purchase price up front? Um, or is very few. Rare? Very, very few. few. So, I mean, if you're, if you're after 100% cash up front, then you ex should expect to get more of like a private buyer valuation. Gotcha. Very, yeah. very rare. I mean, so in that case, I mean, you're better off just selling it to a to a private buyer. I mean, potentially, it depends on what you're looking for. Look, if you're if you're 65 years old and you're a one doctor practice and you want to give up all the management, you don't want to deal with that headache anymore, but you want to keep working for five more years, and a DSO will pay you as much or a little bit more than what a private buyer will pay. I mean, that's probably the route to go because if you sell to a private buyer. They're going to they want, want to come in and they're going to want all the production, right? So you're right. going to be out the door sooner rather than later. So again, it, it's situational, but your valuation is definitely going to take a hit if you're looking for a hundred percent cash at close. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, let me, 
Let me read through some of these other these comments. Uh, yeah, and I got I got two more uh, two more mistakes I want to yeah. hit. I Tell me, make sure we hit before we we wrap. But go ahead. Yeah. No, got? no, go ahead. No, you're you're. Oh, here's a good one actually. So a lot of dentists own their real estate. Um, are are DSOs interested in buying the real estate too, or should you hold on to it? Most of our clients will choose to hold on to the real estate because now they have a very well capitalized tenant. They're going to get a nice market rate and they can, you know, it's going to be a long-term annuity and investment for them. Some prefer to liquidate the real estate. Very few DSOs actually want to buy real estate. There are a handful of them that do, but mm -hmm. most of them want to keep their powder dry for, you know, growth and acquisitions rather than investment in real estate. Oftentimes they'll partner with a REIT. Uh, there's also some, some other real estate companies out there that are specifically designed to buy real estate alongside a DSO transaction. So there's a lot of optionality there, but most of our clients choose to, to hang on to the real estate uh, or, or they may, you know, do the DSO deal and turn around and, and flip the real estate in a few years. They've got a long-term well-capitalized tenant. It's going to make that property, you know, more value than it valuable than if it was just occupied by a, a single location, you know, single owner, um, so it should be looked at favorably from an investment perspective if you've got a larger, more well-capitalized tenant there. I gotcha. All right. Yeah. Tell me, tell me the, uh, the other, uh, the next one. Yeah. So a couple of things I want to touch on. So everybody talks about EBITDA multiple, EBITDA multiple, EBITDA multiple, right? But what's more important when you talk economics than the multiple is the, the number that multiple is being applied to. And a lot of DSOs play games with EBITDA. I mean, their goal at the end of the day is to buy the practice for as little as they possibly can. So they're going to try to convince you that your EBITDA is lower sometimes than it actually is. They're going to say they have to layer on benefits or do this or do that. Um, so it's going to impact your EBITDA adversely. A big part of what we do is control the narrative regarding EBITDA. In my opinion, EBITDA should be, should be objective. And we want to make sure we do a, a comprehensive and accurate EBITDA analysis from day one to create a predictable result <clears throat> when we go to market and controlling that narrative regarding EBITDA, you know, arguing about ad backs and controlling the narrative through quality of earnings. And if there is a discrepancy, being able to articulate why we feel that, you know, we can stand behind our EBITDA versus what they're seeing is critically important because for every dollar in EBITDA, it's worth somewhere between, you know, five to $10 in value. So controlling that narrative and making sure that you've got an advisor that comes at it from a financial perspective and understands EBITDA and is prepared to defend it, it is critically important. And a lot of advisors, I mean, all my guys are finance, banking guys. We all come at it, CPAs, we all come at it from a financial standpoint first. A lot of people out there that do what we do, they don't understand the numbers. They're not prepared. They haven't done their homework. They don't know how to control the narrative regarding EBITDA. So that's that's a huge, huge element of what we do. I didn't think about that. Um, you know, even something as simple as they might say, well, you're paying, your your staff costs are are not normal. They're below average. So we're going to add back additional staff costs because that's the market rate or that's what what it should be. Um, and, and, and I guess I can see that happening where, um, or you're, paying for some product or service that was discounted back in the day and you're basically on the grandfather price. And now they, they say, well, we're going to basically have to sign new contracts. So everything is going to cost more. So the profitability of that practice goes down and they, they start adjusting things. Well, correct. They, they, they do their own analysis and their own adjustments. Look, some of that stuff's real, right? So like if you're, if you're a network with Delta premier, and, and that's going to go away when you sell your practice and reimbursement rates are going to come down. You know, that, that's, that's tangible, right? That's real. But let's get in front of that, you know, before we take the practice to market and set an expectation, that there's going to have to be an adjustment there. And if that makes it economically not feasible to sell, then, hey, let's not go to market, right? Let's not waste our time. We just try to eliminate all the surprises. And then when they try to make adjustments that are uncalled for, we try to, you know, fight against them. And then we'll argue, hey, yeah, okay, so you're going to try to hit us for that adjustment over there, but we didn't factor in the fact that dental supplies are running at 6%, and we know you're going to be able to overnight leverage them down to 4 I mean, you want to get in that argument? Let's go tick for tat, and we'll talk about the economies of scale that you're bringing to the table that are going to increase EBITDA, 
and then we'll, we'll we'll look at you know the addbacks that you're trying to disallow and see that how that all weighs out. That's a delicate song and dance. And if you don't do your homework on the front end, you just have to live with whatever the buyer throws your way. Right. Um, so and that could apply to I mean labs. I mean they have relationship with labs that that you get cheaper pricing. Insurance contracts. I mean PPO fees uh, fee schedules are sometimes a lot higher than uh, you know. I know dentists that they'll tell me, well, I only get 800 bucks for, for this crown, but my friend works for a DSO and they get a thousand dollars for a crown. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a lot more money per, per procedure right there. Yeah. Yep. I mean, across the board, there's, there's multiple, you know, expense categories where they can save money. They can leverage better reimbursement rates from payers. I'd say outside of Delta Delta is the one. You know, I know that's like a four letter word in, in the <laughs> dental industry now uh, for most uh, practice owners. Um, but yeah, I mean, fighting that fight. Right. And, and being able to, to be prepared, especially for a potential retrade. Right. So you 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 go through this whole process of interviewing all these DSOs. You you find the one that's the right fit. You leverage the competition to get the best offer. You're stoked. You sign an LOI and then you enter a quality of earnings due diligence process. And let's say that, you know, your numbers soften, you know, they've softened in the, in the meantime, we've seen that, right? We've seen staff costs go up from the time we started marketing a practice to the time we navigate uh, the quality of earnings process. You've had to give staff raises or you've had to replace some staff or replace a doctor at a higher comp rate that erodes EBITDA. Um, maybe there's a downturn in revenue that eroded EBITDA in the meantime, so the DSO does their quality of earnings. They're like, hey, man, we, we've got a delta we've got to deal with that we've got to address. You know, if it is $100,000 off from where it was when you did your analysis, it's a 7X multiple. We got to chop $700,000 off the purchase price. No, that's where we lean in and say, all right, let's talk about some mitigating factors. Is this EBITDA delta temporary or permanent? Is it tangible or are you just trying to negotiate? And then if it is tangible, how do we make it up, right, in structure? Can we do an earn out and give the doctor the opportunity to get a hold? Um, can we meet in the middle and maybe you were going to knock $700,000 off the purchase price, but you know you were in a competitive situation. Are you willing to maybe eat a, a portion of it? Those conversations are really, really delicate. And our ability to navigate those, one, it depends on how well we know the numbers. And then two, the relationship that we have with that particular DSO. You're good for one deal, right? You've got one practice. I'm good for hundreds of transactions. Right. They're going to treat our clients better than they would treat you on your own because they care about the relationship with our firm. So we're able to leverage that to some degree. I got you. All right. So what's the, the last mistake? Yeah. So I definitely want to spend a little time talking about this. And the last mistake is falling for a gimmick. With all the money, private equity money, flowing into the dental space. There's been a lot of new advisors, right? Enter the space. There's been a lot of predatory marketing, targeting dentists for people that are trying to get their hands on a commission uh, or a piece of a deal in, in some way. There has been a massive amount of, of infrastructure uh, and an industry that's been developed around the DSO space and, and the fact that there's so much money flowing into that space. So buy side advisors, that's something to be aware of. There are people out there that are calling on dentists, pretending like they're sell side advisors that you know, they're going to bring a dentist to a DSO and help negotiate a deal for free. Well, who's paying their commission? The DSO is. Right. Who do they represent? They right. represent whoever's paying their commission. They're right. not in your corner. Their job is to just generate a lead for the DSO, sit back, let the DSO do their thing, hopefully have you, you know, accept an offer without competition, and then they're going to get a fee from the DSO when that deal closes. Buy-side advisors are not your friend. They don't represent you. You need a sell-side advisor. The other thing that I want to talk about is the roll-up concept, okay? There, there are several different people out in the marketplace today that are trying to convince doctors, hey, join our DSO, doctor-owned DSO, or whatever the hell you want to call it. Mm -hmm. We're going to band together. 
you know, 50, 100 practices, and we're going to pretend like we're a DSO. And you might be worth Dr. 6X times EBITDA on your own, but if you join our group, we're going to sell as a collective for 10, 12 times EBITDA. That, to be frank, is complete and utter bullshit. I mean, that's that's happening a lot. Like I'm even in the group, I'm noticing there's like there's Dennis. They'll be like, DM me for for more information on, on how I've done my DSO and, and we've got a new one, this and that. Blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> I've seen that actually happen. What what is that concept about? I mean, the the it's it's a classic bait and switch, right? Hey, join our collective our co-op or whatever you want to call it, you're going to pay me a fee to join, right? You're going to pay me management fees along the way for the management and consulting that I'm giving you. And you're going to pay me a hefty transactional fee if and when we actually sell the group to private equity or DSO. Um, so it's, it's set up in a way that for the person that's formed it and that's running it, it's a, it's a no-lose situation, right? They're right. going to get fees regardless and then if they pull off, you know, the Hail Mary with one second on the clock, you know, they're going to get a big transactional fee. The reality is this. Private equity is not stupid. And why would they buy an unintegrated group of practices when they can go buy MB2 for 13x or 15x, right? Why when they can buy a legitimate, fully integrated DSO that's actually got pedigree? right? That's got synergies, that's got economies of scale, where all the docs are swimming in the same direction. And they only have to close one transaction, by the way, because it's an actual real company. They're going to go buy that for 12, 13, 15x. They're not going to buy some loosely affiliated group of dentists that all have to agree to sell simultaneously to the same DSO for the same multiple at the same deal structure which is really crippling from an optionality standpoint, they're not going to pay up for that. They might cherry pick a handful of practices out of that group and pay a slightly enhanced multiple. But at the end of the day, once you net out all the fees that the, the people that form these groups are charging, you're actually going to be at a lower net uh, proceeds than you would if you had just sold to that DSO on your own. So don't fall for that crap. It is, it's not real. It hasn't materialized. Um, and it's not going to. And the other thing that they fail to realize is, look, in order to generate arbitrage in the private equity world, you can't pay 12X for an unintegrated DSO co-op and then spend all the time and energy that it takes to build it and money that it takes to actually integrate those practices and build infrastructure around them and then continue to grow and create a return. It's too big a lift. It financially yeah. does not work. These things are, are built to do one thing and one thing only, and that's to profit the person that formed it. End of story. Are there can, a lot of them out there? There's just a handful. There, there's, there's probably four or five of them. Um, there, there's a couple that are notorious that send a ton of email marketing and uh, look, man, it's predatory. I've been in this industry a long time. My job is to protect this industry and to protect doctors and educate them. And as you can tell, it pisses me off when I see people coming to the marketplace selling snake oil. Wow. Yeah, I, it's, I, I've seen it happen in the group. Uh, you know, some random doctor says like, hey, I've got this and that going on and DM me for, for more information. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Okay, now I kind of get to uh, find out a little bit of that. Yeah, and look, is it possible like, hey, you've got yourself and a few like-minded dentists sure. in the same geography, right, that have similar practices, that have similar goals and what they want to accomplish and sell in their practice. Is it possible to band together a handful of practices and sell them together for a slightly higher multiple? You know, maybe one to two turns of EBITDA higher. Yes, we've done that. That is possible. It's hard to pull off, right? But it's possible. It is not possible to, to band together 100 practices and sell them for 12X as if they're actually a legitimate DSO. 
so so these so-called DSOs charge a management fee what per month like for them to to be part of that yeah I mean typically you got to pay a fee to join and then they're charging a management fee along the way and then they're charging a massive transaction fee typically around 10 percent of enterprise value when they transact if they transact so I mean you can net out at the end of the day you can pay 20 percent of the value of your practice in fees you better get a big lift in the EBITDA multiple if you're going to pay 20 percent in fees right yeah interesting wow that's a good one learn something new yeah so don't don't fall for a gimmick um that that, that was my last one all right fair enough all right. Well, this was this was a lot of fun. Um, I know we're going to do this again. There's so many questions. Questions might pop up um, here shortly once once this ends. Um, so stick around in the group. Uh, you know, if you come across any questions, feel free to answer them. Um, anything anything else on your end? Um, no, if you're good with it, Sonny, I'd, I'd love to give my contact information so Docs sure. can, can reach out and I'll obviously comment on on the Facebook Live as well. But uh, I'm always available. Whether you've got a you're looking at the option, you want to know if it makes sense, or you, you've got an offer in front of you, you want to know what I think or what I know about the DSO. Uh, you can reach me on my cell, 512-660-8505. Email brannon at dentaltransitions.com. That's B-R-A-N-N-O-N at dentaltransitions.com. And check out our website. It's got a lot of useful information. Uh, it's dentaltransitions.com. Appreciate you having me, man. Always, always a blast talking to you. For sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll do this, uh, here, uh, next month. Cool. Thanks. All right. Take care. Thanks Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Let me just.